Hey, welcome to Flint River. I'm excited that you're joining us for worship this morning. Uh, what an incredible Bible study that we have. We're looking at the mighty prophet Jeremiah and with this great man of God whose courage was off the chart, we're going to look at a side of him that you may not be familiar with. There were times in his life and in his ministry where he just got so discouraged, so down, he was ready to quit. He was ready to hang it up. I'm done. I'm out of here. I've had all I can take. And I know that you and I have been in those exact same places, whether it's our home, our work, our marriage, our school, we've all been there. So what we're going to do today is we're going to walk with Jeremiah and we're going to see how he dealt with those feelings of discouragement. And we're going to learn how not to quit. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot ever quit. We'll be right back in just a minute and we'll finish our study. When darkness tries to roll over my boat When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Oh, my feet does this stand a chance when I stand in your love and my fear? Does it stand a chance when I stand in your love and my fear? Does it stand a chance when I stand in your love? Oh, she no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind Oh, I won't be shaken And I won't be shaken And my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love And my fear doesn't stand a chance When I Stand in your love and my fear Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love There's power that can break off every chain There's power that can lift me out the grave Oh, there's grace There's power in you 
Let me begin with a little background information so that you can understand where we are in the history there of Israel. The kingdom's been divided. Northern kingdom, southern kingdom. 120 years ago, God allowed Syria to come and defeat the northern kingdom because prophet after prophet God sent there to tell the people to turn their hearts back to Him. They wouldn't listen to any of them. And so God just did what He said He was going to do. He brought judgment. And now 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel are gone. They were taken throughout the Syrian empire and dispersed. And they'll never be back. So it's been 120 years. And to the southern kingdom called Judah, God has now sent prophet after prophet after prophet. And uh, they wouldn't listen to any of them either. And so uh, we're, we're to the place to where the people just did not think that any of these messages from the prophets applied to them. They were banking on the fact that they were living totally separate from God, totally apart from what He desired for them to do. But every now and then, they would appear at the temple for worship, and that made life okay. Matter of fact, one of Jeremiah's messages to the people was that you're pretending to worship, and it's not even real. Well, last week we talked about Babylon. God has brought Babylon now down against the southern kingdom of Judah. And Babylon comes in three different waves, three different times they're going to invade Jerusalem and carry off people as captives. We talked about the first one last week. And all of these things happen in the middle of Jeremiah's ministry. He was a prophet of God for 40 years. And in these 40 years, he had one message. And and it was just the same message. You have got to turn from the way that you're living. You're living away from God. God wants you to love Him, worship Him, and serve Him only. And you need to quit pretending and you need to quit playing games. And that was a hard message to give to the people that you love. Jeremiah had a love for the people of Judah. He he had grown up right outside of Jerusalem. He knew the area. He knew the people. Uh, He was friends with so many. And it's hard to be condemning to people that you're so close to. But yet, that's the job that Jeremiah was given. And so, uh, it's 586 B.C. And so this is the end of that 20-year period of time. Babylon has come now for the third time, and this will be that final time of total destruction. Babylon comes and they've burned all the other cities in Judah, totally demolished them. They've come against Jerusalem. They've cut down every tree to use that as battering rams and to build siege works against the city. Jerusalem's trying to hold its own and and not be uh, overrun again. But it's total devastation. People are massacred. The whole place is destroyed. The mighty temple that Solomon built is totally knocked down. Everything is burned. The temple, all the houses, everything. Massacre. It honestly looked like maybe a nuclear explosion had taken place. The people now were carried off as captives. This is the third group now that's gone. The only people they left behind were the poorest of the poorest of the poor. And they were just there because the Babylonians didn't want them. And so just leave them there. They don't matter at all. And so this is the context of where Jeremiah was called to be a prophet of God. Oh, and uh, boy, it was a hard life because the people didn't respond to him. The people didn't respect him at all. They hated him. They, uh, uh, they, they did so many different things. They had him beaten in public. They had him uh, put in stocks. And they, had, they falsely arrested him several times. They put him on trial for his life. They arrested him for treason when that was not the case. Misinformation, to use a buzzword of today. And then ultimately, they tried several several different times to kill him. They finally threw him in an empty well. There was no water in the bottom of the well, but the mud was so thick and gooey, he just sank down in the mud and they left him in that well just to starve to death, just to finally be rid of him. Jeremiah had a hard life. Life was tough for him. And he got to the place where he said, I'm done. I'm done. 
I, I've, I've had all of this I can take, and I'm just fed up. How did Jeremiah handle feeling that way? Oh, those are the things that we're going to see today as we walk through different stages of his life. And as we walk through Jeremiah's life and his heart and his feelings and his emotions, as he dealt with these things and struggled with them, I want you to know there's no difference in what Jeremiah felt and went through than what you and I go through when we get into times of discouragement like that. So we can take what Jeremiah learned and what worked for him and apply those things to our lives because God doesn't want us to be frustrated or discouraged. And just like Jeremiah, you and I can never, ever, ever, ever give up. Let's learn how. Let's see what Jeremiah did, all right? There's four things that I want you to walk away with today that will help you. I hope you'll keep these in your Bible somewhere because uh, when you get in a time like this, they're always good to pull out and just kind of get refocused and refreshed spiritually. So let's look at the first thing. We're going to look in Jeremiah 32. We're going to be, it looks like we're skipping around in Jeremiah because the book of Jeremiah is not written chronologically. All right. The, the events didn't happen in the exact order of the chapters. All right. So we're going to be going from the front to the back and that's okay. Jeremiah chapter 32. I want to read verses 17 through 20. And I want you to get a sense of uh, Jeremiah's uh, relationship with Almighty God. Listen at this. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth, and by your great power and outstretched arm, there is nothing too hard for you. You show loving kindness to thousands and repay the iniquity, the sin of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great the mighty God, almighty Jehovah God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Are you hearing Jeremiah? Man, he's so focused on who God is. Listen, let's keep going. Verse 19, you are great in counsel and mighty in work for your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. You have set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt to this day and in Israel and in among other men. You have made yourself a name as it is this day. Man, when you feel the, the discouragement setting in, when it feels like, man, you've had all you can take and it's just ready to, you're ready to throw the towel in. Here's, here's step number one. Always remember who God is. Always focus on the Lord. Reestablish that focus on Almighty God. We learned a couple of things last week that play into this week's message just as well. Number one, God's always present. There will never be a time, if you're a believer, that you're all by yourself. You never go through problems. You will never go through any type of crisis, any type of issue all alone. Now, God's always there. He promised us His presence as a believer, as His child. Now, with that, you've got to know that one of Satan's greatest attacks on us as believers is to try to get us to feel isolated. He wants us to feel like that nobody else has ever gone through what you're going through. Nobody else has ever felt as discouraged as you do. You are an absolute failure. I can't believe that you are where you are. If Satan can get you isolated and feeling that way, he's got you so set up to absolutely go ahead and quit. Just cash in the chips, be done with everything. And you cannot, you cannot, you cannot ever quit. God is always present. We talked last week that He's always in control. 
That doesn't mean that He caused your problem. That doesn't mean that He created the issues that you're in or the situation you're having to deal with. But He wants to use you and He wants to use that situation to teach you and to mold you and to shape you so that your faith can grow and be stronger. So that you can grow through this experience and end up being more like Him. He wants you to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, and then in the middle of all of this, while you're focusing on God, you've got to understand the phenomenal picture of Almighty God that is painted in the book of Jeremiah. All right, get in, in context again. You've got 120 years now that the people have been warned. They've been loved. They've been shared with. You're, you've got to turn around. You're going the wrong way. You've got to give your life back to God. Surrender to Him. And for 120 years, they've said no. Look at the picture of the patience and the mercy of Almighty God. Oh, what a merciful God. Would, if you had been God, would you have waited 120 years? Or would you have just brought the hammer down, brought judgment after a week or two weeks or six months or maybe a year? 120 years, God pled with these people through these prophets. And for 120 years, He would have forgiven them in an instant if they had turned their lives around, if they had said, God, we're sorry. God, we've been wrong. God, take us back. But the patience and the mercy of God is overwhelming. And that just leads right into the, to the love of God. Also, for those 120 years, there was prophet after prophet after prophet. Some of the prophets even overlapped in their ministries. God sent the prophets to every town, to every area, to every person. Won't you please turn back? Because of His love for them, God didn't want to punish them. But ultimately, after 120 years, God is a just God which means His character and His nature is known by justice as much as mercy, as much as patience, as much as love. There comes the point in time where the justice of God says, I have to punish sin. And your time is up. And that's where uh, the southern kingdom of Judah got to. And He had to bring the Babylonians down and bring judgment that He had warned them about for 120 years on these dear people. Oh, listen, when discouragement sinks in, man, take your eyes off of the situation. I don't care how bad it looks. I don't care how long you've been going through it. I want you to focus on who God is. Begin like Jeremiah. Just thank God. God, thank you for being so loving, so kind, so almighty, so all-powerful. Begin to brag on God, just like Jeremiah did in this passage. Tell Him how great and mighty He is. And when you will take your eyes and your mind and your focus off of your situation and put it on Almighty God, you'll see that everything will begin to look a little bit brighter. Well, let's take another step. Not only do you have to take your eyes off of your situation, but here's the second thing that's really important. You've got to take your eyes off of ourselves. See, we get so inward focused when things come against us, whether people are attacking us or just it seems like our life is falling apart. Everything is going the wrong way. And uh, all of a sudden, you and I get the oh, poor me's and we start feeling sorry for ourselves. We begin to develop a victim mentality. And it, it, it's, it, <laughs> it, it's just all about us. Remember this, life is hard. It's hard for everybody, but every believer, every even, we can go beyond that. Every person, every adult, every student, every child in some way has experienced hardships and problems in life. That's not just something that's restricted to adults. I mean, our children are going through hard times. 
And sometimes it's because, whether it's us or the children, decisions that we've made. Poor choices, bad decisions. And boy, this is the situation now that I've got to live with and deal with. Sometimes the decisions were made by other people, but they affect us. For our children, sometimes it's the decisions that mom and dad made that the kids now have to live with and deal with. Sometimes for us as adults, maybe it was the decision of a spouse, Maybe it was the decision of our employer to downsize. And our, our unit, our section has been cut out or cut down. I've lost my job. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's financial. But everybody goes through times and they think life is just too hard. And our eyes are so focused. Well, Jeremiah went through the same thing. We're not dealing with anything that he didn't go through. I want you to listen to his heart. I mean, this, this is heart-wrenching when you hear the heart of Jeremiah. In chapter 20, I'm going to read from 14 to 18. And I want you to listen. Let's take it slow. Listen to what he cries out to God. Cursed be the day that I was born. I want you to notice how many references to himself are in this passage because we just get so inward focused. You know, we, I made up the phrase a long time ago, one of the worst diseases that believers suffer when they're discouraged in times like this is we suffer from ingrown eyeballs. We turn all of our focus, all of our attention. We can't see other people. We can't see other things because all I'm entrenched with is me. Oh, poor me. Listen to Jeremiah. Cursed be the day in which I was born. Let the day not be blessed in which my mother bore me. Let the man be cursed who brought news to my father saying, a male child has been born to you, making him very glad, talking and referring to himself. Verse 16, and let that man be like the cities which the Lord overthrew and did not relent. Let him hear the cry in the morning and the shouting at noon because he did not kill me from the womb. Jeremiah is wishing he'd never been born, that my mother might have been my grave and her womb always enlarged with me. Oh God, I hate that I was even born. Verse 18, and why did I come forth from the womb to see labor and sorrow that my days should be consumed with shame? Ha. Huh. Did you ever think that a mighty man of God would get to the same place that you and I get to at times? But here's the thing. I know I've said it already several times. As down as he was, as bad as the situation made him feel, he never, ever, ever quit. And you can't afford to quit, and I can't afford to quit. All right? Take our eyes off of ourselves. So here's the thing that you've got to remember. See, we're so inward focused and our sin nature has us thinking we've bought the lie somewhere that God's purpose is to make me happy. And right now I'm not happy. I'm defeated and I'm discouraged. And it's God's it's God's job to make things better and to make me happy. And that's so far from the truth. See, God's greatest, God's greatest challenge is to make us holy, more like Him than to make us happy. And sometimes God takes us through hard times to make us stronger. And we cannot, we cannot, we cannot ever quit. Well, let's look. Let's keep going. Uh, uh, in verse 4 through 7 of chapter 1, very first verses of Jeremiah, I want you to listen uh, what God says to Jeremiah. And here's from the very beginning of his mighty book. Here's what I want you to see. God had a purpose for Jeremiah's life. Now listen, and he's got a purpose for your life and for my life, if you're a believer, 
just like he did for Jeremiah. Chapter 1, verse 4 and verse, through verse 7. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Oh, life begins at conception. Life doesn't begin at birth. He formed Jeremiah and he knew who he was when he was conceived. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I called you to be my own. I ordained you. I set you apart to be a prophet to the nations. That was God's purpose for Jeremiah's life. And then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I can't speak, for I'm just a youth. Oh, listen, our students a lot of times think, you know what, life as a teenager doesn't really matter. Life doesn't really start counting until you get to be an adult, until I get out of college, get a job, get married, start a family. Then that's when God really starts looking at me. But I want all of our students to know this. God said to Jeremiah, don't you think that just because you're a student, just because you're a youth, that you don't count, that you don't matter, that you can't serve me, that I can't call you. Listen to what he said, verse 7. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm a youth. Oh no, don't go there. For you as a student shall go to all whom I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. I've got a will for your life as a believer. Whether you're eight years old or 38 or 98, I've got a will. And that will really comes in two different parts. Walk with me for a minute. There's a general will that applies to all believers. Whatever your age, however long you've been a believer, there's a general will for all of us. And it's this. It's God's will for us to know Him. That personal relationship where we surrendered our life to Him, that's what began our personal relationship with Him. And God desires for that to grow, grow deeper, grow more intimate, for our trust to go, for grow, for our faith to grow. He desires for all believers to know Him. He desires for all believers to grow more like Him. And then those are general. Those are for everybody. He desires for all believers to serve Him. There is a way that God has designed you and He has shaped you. He's give you, given you the personality. He's given you the family, the background, the experiences, the education, the knowledge. He's gifted you. You have certain talents and abilities that other people don't. And there is a very unique gift mix is what it's called in every believer. Nobody's like you. You are very unique in the eyes and the hand of God. And He created you that way because He's got a special purpose for you. It's to know Him. It's to grow more like Him. It's to serve Him. And it's to share with other people how they can surrender their lives to you. Know, grow, serve, and share. That's general. That's for every believer that is true. But now... Inside of that general will, he's got a very specific will. You see, he's got a special way that he designed you. He's got a special way that he wants you to serve him. A special way, a special place around a special group of people. And that's something that he has called you to do. And I'm blown away at the number of believers that have no clue what God's will for their life is. Some way or another, they think, well, I've, I, I've given Jesus my life. I've asked Him to be my Savior. Now, I just need to go through life and be a great parent, be a good spouse, be a great employee or employer, make a living, provide for my family, be as good as I can, come to church when I can. I'm just living the Christian life and I'm blown away that there's so many believers that totally miss accomplishing God's will for their life. They never know God's will. They've never looked for God's will. They've never prayed about God's will. They're just doing what they think is best and right. 
But God says, no, I formed you. I have a special purpose for you. And in times of discouragement, it is so important, one, to, to get your eyes off the situation and focus on Almighty God. That was the first thing we talked about. To get your eyes off your situation and in turn, get your eyes off yourself. And then begin to focus on what God has called you to do. How has He asked you to serve Him? Has He asked you to serve Him in some local church, in our church here at Flint River? Are there ways that you can serve Him here? Surely you're not a spectator where you just come and sit and let other people do all the work to serve you, provide for you, and, and teach you, and you're just a taker and you've never been a giver. Surely not. There's ways to serve Him in the church. We have so many ways in our community that we can be involved and serve Him and allow other people to be affected by our life and our walk with the Lord. We have partnerships overseas. There are so many ways that you can go with us overseas when the COVID restrictions lift and we can get back into the countries. And you can be a part of changing lives in the places where we have partnerships. What has God called you to do? And if you've never discovered that, my friend, that needs to be your task. That needs to be a priority in your life. All right? All of that, you begin this purpose when you begin your walk with God. At surrender of your life, when God gave you salvation, He gave you forgiveness, and He also gave you a purpose. Oh, I challenge you to know your purpose. And then the last thing is this. The last thing is what I've said several times. You can never, ever, ever, ever afford to quit. Quitting is the most selfish thing you could possibly do. And the cost is just too high. Somebody's watching you. A lot of people are watching you. Your family's watching you. Your friends at work, around you, your neighbors. If you're a student, the kids at school are watching you. And if you just fold up and quit, I'm going to tell you what, you're going to discourage other people. They're going to watch you and your quitting is going to damage their walk with God. Your quitting could totally destroy what they are and who they are. The cost is too big. You cannot afford to quit. If you quit, not just what it affects other people, but this purpose that God's created you for goes unfulfilled. Have you ever thought about that? Now listen, God's going to find somebody else to do what you failed to do. God's going God's to pick up your slack. But you know what? You will never get to hear Him say, when we get to heaven and stand before Him, you'll never get to hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud that you accomplished my purpose for you. Oh, folks, that's worth everything in life. Life is so much bigger than you are. Do you know God's will for your life, His purpose for your life? You cannot afford to quit. Now, as we've walked all these weeks from the beginning of our study in January through all these different eras, and this ends up the era known as the divided kingdom. We'll start a new era next week. But all through here, we've found all through the Scriptures different pictures, different prophecies of the coming Messiah. We're still just inside of 600 years before the birth of Christ. But what a beautiful picture Jeremiah paints of the coming Messiah. And he even gets specific and he begins to talk about a new covenant that this Messiah is coming to provide for us. That's the first reference to that. Listen to what he says in Jeremiah chapter 23 verses 5 and 6. Behold the days are coming. When that phrase days are coming, it's talking about in the last days which we are in the midst of. Behold the last days are coming said the Lord that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king. The, the Messiah is coming. 
And he's going to be from the lineage of King David. Which, if you will look in Matthew chapter 1, Matthew traces the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ all the way back to the mighty King David. It was absolutely fulfilled exactly like God said. A branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. Listen to how many times you hear the word righteousness. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called. The Lord our righteousness. Oh, folks, righteousness. That very word means to have a right relationship with Almighty God that only comes in a personal relationship with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, our Messiah. Look at another passage of Scripture in Jeremiah 31 as he begins to talk about the new covenant that this Messiah is going to make available to us. Verse 31 in chapter 31, Behold, the days are coming. There it is again, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers and the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery in Egypt, through the Red Sea, at Mount Sinai, he made that covenant. And that's been 900 years ago. He says, my covenant, which they broke, Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Notice it's with the house of Israel. The Jewish people. His chosen people, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be be my people. There's coming a day in the last days when God's going to take the blinders off of the Jewish people. And they're going to see that the one that was pierced, the Lord Jesus Christ who went to the cross, was really the Messiah. How could they have missed it all these years? And their eyes are going to be open and they're going to fall down on their faces and come back to Almighty God Through the Messiah, He's going to forgive them. They're going to be saved. That's going to be the biggest revival that we've ever seen. Let's end up in verse 34. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. Not know about me, but know me personally through the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. From the, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, their sins, and their sin I will remember no more. Isn't that amazing? That's a prophecy written to the Jewish people. There's coming a day when these people who are so close to being saved, their love for Almighty God. If you'll go to Israel with us when we go each year, we go to the to the temple mount there, to the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall. The people's absolute love and adoration for Almighty God puts mine to shame. I go there and I, I, and I weep many times because I, I cry. I say, Lord, why can't I love you like they do? I am so ashamed of my love and my commitment when I see theirs. But there's blinders on their eyes. They have such a love for Almighty God, but they can't see the Messiah. They can't see that Jesus has already come and that He was God in the flesh. But the day's coming when they will, when those blinders are off. Here's the good news. You know, the word gospel literally means the good news. Here's the gospel for you and for me today is this. God's taken what He promised to His special people and He's made it available to me and you. When Jesus went to the cross, He paid the penalty for your sin debt and my sin debt. The sin debt of the Jewish people, yes. The sin debt of Gentiles for everybody else in the world, yes. Does that include me? Yes. Does it include you? Yes. He made available to me and to you as Gentiles what He had promised to His special people. 
we can know Him. We can be in His family. We can be His children. We can have that personal relationship with Almighty God that He promised to His special people that they can enjoy. We can be forgiven. We can be saved. That's when He comes. That's when He gives us our, our, our purpose in life. That's when we come to know Him. And then our... our our will, His will for us is to know and to grow, to be more like Him, to serve Him with all of our heart and to tell other people how they can come to know Him. Wow, how amazing is that? When's the last time you felt like quitting, just giving up? Jeremiah did. And if that's where you are today, folks, I hope this has helped you. I hope this has been an encouragement to you. And the first step in finding that peace that God wants to give you in the midst of the discouragement is knowing Him personally. Have you surrendered your life to Him? Have you come to Him and said, God, thank you that you loved me so much that you left heaven and came to this earth as a man. Perfect, almighty God, perfect man, all in one. And you went to the cross as my substitute so that your holy, sinless blood could make available my salvation, my forgiveness. Thank you for that, Father. And I want to tell you right now, I want you to be my Messiah. I want to be saved. Would you come and live inside of me? Would you forgive me? Would you give me that new heart, new life that you promised that you would? If you're a believer already, Man, are you in the middle of a discouraging time? He's given us such a prescription of how to get out of the, out of the ditch and get back to loving Him, knowing Him, and serving Him. Will you follow these easy steps? Call out to Him today. God, I'm very discouraged. I'm very defeated. But I'm going to start with step one. What a mighty God you are. If you'll follow these steps that Jeremiah gave us, I think you'll see a mighty change in your heart, in your life, and in your walk with the Lord. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our study today. Uh, we start a brand new era next week, and I can't wait uh, to teach that to you. I hope these are, are very real lessons. I hope not only are you learning about the Bible and about God's Word a long time ago, but I hope you're seeing how much it applies to our lives today. Be encouraged. Be on fire. Be real. God loves you, and He will never, ever leave you as a believer. Have a great week. I'll see you next Sunday. 